Okay, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the fifth session of the Synoikosis Digital Classics uh, Fall 2009 semester on digital cultural heritage. Um, this semester is co-organized by Valeria Vitale at the, University, at the Institute of Classical Studies, University of London, um, and myself, Gabriel Vidar, also at the Institute of Classical Studies. Um, and this session will be on digital gazetteers and will be co-presented by um, with everybody by Valeria Vitale, um, by Johan Ulfeldt at Gothenburg, and by Tom Elliott at New York University. Um, and I want to very quickly um, just to say to anybody who's watching on YouTube, um, please do um, see the um, on your top uh, right hand side there is a live chat window. Um, please do introduce yourself in that window so we know who's watching and you feel free to ask questions and make comments at any time during the um, during the session. We'll be looking out on that and we'll respond to you if, um, if you do so. Um, but um, first I'll hand over to, um, to Valeria who's going to introduce this, this session. Uh, thank you Gabi. Just wanted to start with a very brief uh, introduction to Digital Gazetteer and then I am uh, really, really delighted. I will be really delighted to uh, leave the floor to two people that you know have created uh, two great examples of historical gazetteers that are largely used in the communities of classicists, ancient historians, archaeologists. Um, so I will start with you know basic uh, basic question: What are digital gazetteers, or what are gazetteers to start with? And um, when I answer this uh, question, I mean, I usually, you know, people can see that I'm really excited about it. So when I when I answer that the, the gazetteer are basically a list of geographical information, um, you know, uh, the reaction is sometimes a little bit disappointed. Uh, but I hope that after uh, hearing more about what you can do with digital gazetteers, uh, you will become, you know, as passionate as we are. Uh, about that. So let's um, uh, let's go back to the definition of uh, gazetteer. Um, they are by no means a digital concept. There were gazetteers before we had digital tools, but uh, we will be talking uh, uh, more specifically about the digital ones. And there are, I think, many many ways in which digital gazetteers are uh, a step forward uh, compared to traditional gazetteers. And it's not just because they share um, a number of um, perks of all digital products of so being you know, more accessible. You don't need to actually have a physical copy of you know, a printed uh, you know, list of places or you know, a copy of the Barrington Atlas. You can consult it um, online, uh, which is, of course, uh, more, uh, more convenient. But uh, besides these, let's say, practical advantages, I see two uh, very big um, pro arguments for uh, digital gazetteers um, that I am very, very, um, uh, I'm, I'm very keen on uh, discussing with you. And one is the fact that they are collaborative. And being collaborative means that they are, uh, let's say, richer. They uh, can make room for more voices, for more interpretations about places. And we will uh, discuss uh, through our case studies and later on in our more general discussion how, you know, uh, far from straightforward it is uh, to define concepts uh, about ancient places in particular. Um, but the other, um, uh, the other great uh, advantage of using uh, digital gazetteers, and we will discuss that too, is that they offer us the opportunity to use variants. Think, for example, of the variant names or even the variant locations or hypothesis about location that we could associate to the same place or to the same notion of place while in a printed publication, in a more traditional publication, we are somehow forced to, to choose one, to go for one. We will see how uh, digital gazetteers in a way free us uh, from this constraint and make our representation of place more interesting, more complex. Uh, but I want to, um, to use um, uh, my screen and uh, a page from uh, the play of this gazetteer that Tom will be, Tom will be discussing later on uh, to tell you uh, something else 
that is quite crucial about gazetteer and it's not just about their nature but it's also about um, a function that they perform that is pretty unique um, um, about digital gazetteers and it's the fact that they provide us with something that becomes quite crucial in a linked open data environment which is in this case this is the page in player this is the entry in player this for the ancient place of Taras. Um, and uh, here this link that you find here and this you know number here after uh, the generic uh, playlist identifier is you know um, a unique uh, identification a unique uh, code that um, identifies this specific ancient place in the gazetteer of Pleiades. And why that is you know, a crucial role that Pleiades and other gazetteers perform, we will uh, discuss that um, more in detail in our case studies. Um, but um, I wanted to highlight through this example in Pleiades, um, again, something that is quite peculiar about gazetteers. They have somehow um, a double nature, uh, which makes them, I believe, particularly interesting as, you know, as, an, as, as an object, uh, as an academic output. On the one hand, they are a way of representing the information that we have about places. So gazetteers, they help us systematize, structure, collect, connect all the information that we have at the moment about ancient places. And that is, you know, per se, a very, very a remarkable achievement that usually takes, uh, as we said before, not the work of one person, but possibly the work of, you know, uh, a group uh, of researchers, a collaborative um, effort. But uh, on the other hand, digital gazetteers are also a digital infrastructure and providing us with these stable identifiers that identify uniquely, uh, they're called URI, unique resource identifiers, identifying uniquely in a machine uh, readable uh, format, a format that a machine can understand that a reference to a specific place, they play really a crucial role in the linked open data environment. And we will see uh, examples of that in our, um, in our case studies. Um, modeling the information that we have about ancient places, as we said, uh, as we mentioned before, is not straightforward, but it is incredibly fascinating. And that is because it is really challenging, um, in particular when we talk about ancient places, because uh, the information that we have about past places and, you know, the more we go back uh, in the past, the more difficult it becomes. It's because the information that we have about them is often very incomplete, it is vague, it is fragmentary, and sometimes it's even difficult to say, you know, where we can draw the line between historical places and imaginary places. I mean, were they, I mean, was this line as, um, as clear in the past as we see it, um, as we see it today? And gazetteers force us to think about this, to think about our ideas about ancient places, to think how uh, about what are actually the sources about the information that we have um, about their locations, about their places, about their connections. Uh, but it can also become a little bit frustrating because this complexity is very difficult to represent visually, to represent digitally, and it is an ongoing challenge. And there is, you know, no real, no unique, no single. Uh, now, there is no single answer to that. There is, uh, you know, not uh, one model that works uh, um, by default for all the kinds of historical gazetteers. So it's a very, very uh, interesting ongoing discussion that engages um, the scholarly community. Um, for example, also issues of how to flag the certainty, uh, the different, let's say, uh, levels of reliability of the sources that we have, or um, how do we represent, uh, let's say, the borders of regions of interest, um, and so on. These are, again, all open questions that um, we will discuss how Pleiades has dealt with it, how the data gazetteer has dealt with it. But again, we could, um, there is no formula that works, um, that works for, for everyone. Um, another um, 
uh, say, another point of uh, perplexity, uh, another reason of perplexity that I find sometimes when I talk about digital gazetteers in workshops or in classes with the students, um, is that uh, once uh, we explain the role the gazetteers perform in providing unique identifiers so that we can use that identifier each time we want to refer, for example, the ancient city of Taras um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in documents, in the museum, uh, metadata, and so on. So once we discuss you know, this very, very important role of giving a unique, a single identifier, um, some people get a little bit confused by the fact that we have quite a lot of historical gazetteers, and of course, you know, they overlap. And the reason why uh, this happens and the reason why it is, you know, perfectly, uh, you know, reasonable that this happens is that our world is actually really complicated and uh, it would be absolutely impossible to have a single gazetteer that deals with, you know, uh, information from um, about every point uh, on the globe at any point in time from a number of perspectives. It would be, you know, too long uh, to, uh, to create and possibly you know, just, just useless because the information would be so much that we wouldn't find what we're actually looking for. So what gazetteers do usually is to focus on a particular area of interest. And um, we can, uh, Tom and uh, Johan will tell us about the different, you you know, areas they decided to focus on, and it could be geographical, you know, one can choose to focus on, let's say, the Mediterranean area, it could be historical, one could choose to focus on, you know, the ancient world or medieval times, it could be a combination of both, it could be thematic, like uh, a gazetteer of, I don't know, all the Catholic churches that are in the world, um, and so on. Um, and just to uh, give you uh, an idea of uh, why we have different gazetteers, and that is because we have you know, different perspectives about uh, even places that are, if you want, geographically located more or less at the same coordinates, but they're not conceptually the same place because we are not thinking about them uh, in the same perspective. I just want to show you uh, the sort of the same place, uh, the, the modern city of Taranto in another gazetteer. And this is the Geonames gazetteer, which is a contemporary uh, gazetteer. And you can see that they are fairly different, not just in the, in the interface, uh, which already says a lot about the priorities and what is um, uh, what are the most relevant pieces of information that the two gazetteers decide to focus on, uh, but also, yeah, what is, um, let's say, we can guess uh, who are the intended users of the the, these two different gazetteers and, you know, what is the kind of information that, I, that they are looking for. And it would be useless for geonames, for example, to uh, tell their users that Harold used to be called Neptunia, that's not relevant. Uh, to, to, to them, it's not relevant to, to the users of geonames. And uh, similarly, it would be useless uh, or you know, not very relevant for Pleiades to tell uh, classicists where, I don't know, uh, the post office uh, is located in the modern city of Taranto. Um, one last uh, point that I wanted to touch briefly is, uh, or better introduce before I let uh, Tom and Johan uh, tell us more about their gazetteer, is uh, how we can use uh, the identifiers and the information provided by gazetteers in digital culture heritage uh, context and how they can become a very, very powerful way of aggregating information that are in, uh, for example, in different collections, in different digital repositories, in different uh, digital archives that were created separately and independently, but how through the use of gazetteers we may be able to connect them. And I think that I have spoken way more than I was uh, intended to, uh, so I, I'll stop here and um, uh, leave the floor to uh, Tom. Yes. I, I think I'm next. Is that is that uh, everyone else's understanding? Yep. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, so, hi everybody. Thank you for joining us, uh, either uh, live or on tape. Um, I'd like to take a little bit of time to talk about the Pleiades Gazetteer of the Ancient World as, uh, you know, as a um, as an artifact and an example of the kinds of things that Valeria was introducing. Um, I'll pop up the homepage here. And I thought I would start with a very abbreviated origin story, talk a little bit about the extents of the data set and what, what that means, uh, but then move pretty quickly to a discussion of how we model the idea of place and its associated um, attributes, if you will, names and locations and so on, how we do that from an information science perspective uh, in order to be able to serve the various needs of a gazetteer that focuses on things pre-modern. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how uh, Pleiades comes to be and how it continues to update. Um, and uh, then we'll transition to a presentation by Johan uh, concerning the Dare Gazetteer, um, which is a you know a long time sort of uh, both collaborative collaborator and foil to uh, what Pleiades does, and has its own um, specific set of missions that it is meeting um, that are complementary to ours. And so uh, the origin of Pleiades uh, dates back um, in various ways to the early 1980s, but I'm going to leave behind the earliest history and focus uh, primarily on uh, really starting to build the thing that you find on the web now. Um, the ideas for it began to take shape in 1999, 2000, 2001. We were successful in securing a, our first uh, grant funding for Pleiades uh, in at the end of 2005. So work started on, or yeah, work started in 2006 on uh, the project. This was funding from the U.S. National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, which has continued to be a periodic and essential supporter of uh, the Pleiades effort. Uh, we got most of our data into Pleiades by uh, the basic initial set of data by 2010 or so, and uh, we now record about 36,000, almost 37,000 ancient places. Um, this would include everything from settlements mentioned in ancient sources to archaeological sites, um, and it includes things that um, cannot be precisely located today. It also includes uh, peoples and uh, groups other than settlements. So. Um, ethnic groups and regional identities. It also includes various kinds of physical features uh, that were known to or important to the ancients or that archaeologists tells us, uh, archaeology tells us are important for our understanding of the ancient world. Um, this uh, animation on the home page is meant to kind of uh, display to you sort of the range of things we have in Pleiades. Um, what it doesn't do is give you the big picture of what's available. So I'm going to switch to a different um, a different tool, uh, which is uh, a uh, open source piece of software called QGIS. And I want to show you what I did. Um, I went to the Pleiades downloads page and went to one of our export formats. One of the things we do is to provide our data outside of our website so other people can make use of it. And I downloaded this file right here which uh, contains a list of all the places in Pleiades, all 36,000, however many, um, as well as any um, uh, uh, general coordinates we associate with them. Where we have a complex spatial geometry for something, let's say a polygon that outlines a city wall or something, um, that won't be in this file. It'll just be a point for the uh, central area of that, but uh, it gives us a way to quickly map the whole contents of Pleiades. And for that purpose, um, I've got uh, QGIS here, the open source desktop GIS, and I've loaded up that data. So all these um, orange symbols, uh, indicate the current spatial footprint of Pleiades. And uh, if you know something about ancient Eurasia and Northern Africa, you'll notice that this is a spatially biased view. We've got very heavy coverage in the um, Mediterranean penumbra, if you will, the footprint of ancient Greek and Roman civilization, Phoenician and so on. Um, and uh, 
quite a lot of stuff even out into Western China and the Indian subcontinent, but not anywhere near the density. Um, what's going on with that? Is that an indication of the density of ancient uh, settlement and so on? Uh, no, it's not. It's a uh, indication of a bias in Pleiades data. And that bias comes uh, by way of the origin story of Pleiades. We began by trying to take data that had been assembled for the creation of a an atlas, in this case, the, um, the Barrington Atlas of the Greek and Roman world, which I'll just show you the uh, publisher's website for. This was a, uh, a decade plus long effort involving about 200 scholars and cartographers who were trying to produce a printed uh, static atlas of the ancient Greek and Roman world. And they succeeded in doing that in the year 2000. Pleiades represents an attempt to take that information, move it into a thoroughly digital online and open environment and to make it available more broadly for reuse and for updating and expansion. So um, it's natural, I think, that uh, Pleiades would have, uh, at least at the beginning, this kind of a footprint where that's the dominant thing. Does that mean that we've wanted to keep Pleiades isolated to the Greek and Roman world? No, we haven't. What we've tried to do is expand Pleiades in ways that can help other research projects uh, and be a part of the emerging linked spatial data network on the web. Uh, why are we still biased in this way? Um, three reasons, really. One was technical limitations. Uh, we ran into some problems with scaling up to a lot more content, and it took us a while to get money in place to make changes so that we could continue to add material at a high rate of speed. Uh, so that slowed us down in rebalancing. Um, there's also just a disciplinary issue, which is that uh, <clears throat> there are areas of the ancient world, like the Greek and Roman world, where scholarship has produced a lot more information that's readily pulled into Pleiades or another gazetteer, whereas if you talk about ancient Central Asia, we're still very much in a discovery mode uh, for that. So there are some areas where the bias is as a result of uh, the extent of modern scholarship. But um, there's quite a lot of stuff that's not represented here, and I want to show you an example. Um, at the University of Uppsala, there's uh, a, a data file available for Google Earth that was created by Olaf Peterson, uh, which was meant to provide just quick points for um, places of interest in the study of uh, what scholars have called the ancient Near East. And so by that, we mean um, the Levantine coast, portions of ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, uh, uh, and so on. And I thought I would show you a comparison between Pleiades and Paterson. So I pulled down his KML file and dropped it. It's going to take a second to render all of the points perhaps longer than a second. I'm going to go ahead and zoom to that group so we see it a little more closely. I think that um, the competition for computing resources on my machine between QGIS and the video broadcasting software is slowing things down a bit. Um, this was all performing very nicely a little while ago. Um, but we all know how live demos are. Um, at any rate, what you'll notice uh, when this finally displays is that we have quite a lot of um, uh, density in the area of ancient Mesopotamia and surround that doesn't show up in Pleiades. Um, there's really no point, I think, in waiting too long for this. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, zoom in and move on. I really want to show you. Um, yeah, this is just hopeful, hopelessly um, bogged down. Well, I'm sorry about that. Um, I need more CPUs, clearly. Um, what I'm going to do is just switch over to Pleiades, and we'll quit messing with that. Um, Anyway, you have, a, you have an idea of the footprint of Pleiades. We're trying to rebalance that. Um, I wanted to give you an example of what our content looks like in Pleiades. And uh, we're going to go to a site um, that is of interest both uh, for the ancient Near East, the kind of stuff Paterson is 
modeling, ancient Mesopotamia, but that continues to be important during the Greco-Roman period. Um, so this uh, is a site that appears in Pleiades um, from the Barrington Atlas data on because uh, it is a scene of interaction between the ancient, you know, the remains of ancient Mesopotamian culture and Gre Greek and Roman culture beginning in the Hellenistic period uh, 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 extensively. And, um, but what you see now on the Pleiades page for Nineveh is a collection of information that's drawn, uh, drawn in um, both from the Barrington and then subsequent editions by uh, contributors to Pleiades. Um, I'll point out a few things. Uh, this summary here uh, was written by uh, Jamie Novotny, uh, who works uh, for the chair of uh, ancient Near Eastern history in, in uh, Munich. Uh, our, our central location, the central point we have here with the blue icon um, was uh, imported from Dare and uh, Johan may care to address um, that portion of the process. So this was pretty early on. We discovered that Johan had uh, good coordinates for a number of sites that were at a higher resolution than what we had from the Barrington Atlas because of its original scales. And so um, uh, we worked with Johan to bring some of that material in. Uh, we have several of the ancient and modern uh, names for the site of Nineveh recorded. Uh, they've come in from various uh, contributors. We can look at the Turkish one, for example, and see that's one that uh, Jamie also gave us. And, um, and he cites uh, places on the web or in print where that Turkish name comes from. We'll skip this business of connections for a moment and make the point that we do have a typology of sites and uh, we can have one or more references that provide additional information about Nineveh. Uh, in the particular case of Nineveh, uh, we're very well equipped in that regard. Um, we trace back ourselves to the Barrington Atlas, but we also have a number of other resources. Wherever possible, we link to these online um, so that you can uh, either go to the site itself, in this case, um, Brill's uh, New Pauli has a reference, and if your library subscribes to it, you could read what they have to say about Nineveh here. Um, but we also link to Wikipedia, and um, if it's something that's just in print, say this book by Oates, we take you to a bibliographic reference so that you can try to find that work in your local library uh, if you want it. We also relate ourselves to ancient to other gazetteers of interest. Um, uh, I note here that actually, though we have um, borrowed and credited a uh, a bit of geometry from Johan, we haven't actually linked across in our uh, related references to the Dare entry for this particular item. So that's a deficiency in what we have going here. But um, in general, I think you can see the sort of information we're gathering. This big section that I've glossed over in the middle on connections uh, is how we have begun to relate content uh, internally in Pleiades. So we are conscious of the fact that a place in Pleiades can be part of another place. It can be related to another place uh, spatially for um, reasons of administration. You know, so a uh, ancient settlement can be in a particular province. Uh, just in terms of regional geography, the ancients may say that a particular settlement is in a particular region. And uh, these connections are a mechanism that we are using to begin to model that in Pleiades. We have a large number uh, in the case of Nineveh, we have a large number of monuments and physical components of the ancient city that are related to Nineveh itself um, as parts, as topographical components of the place. And um, a lot of this is work that the team at Munich has been doing. Uh, they're using Nineveh as an example of what we can do with this. And this is represented on our map, uh, if we zoom in a bit, and I'm going to choose a um, higher resolution footprint. So this blue dot is the point that we originally got from uh, Dare years ago, and these green icons represent the um, connected separate places that um, Munich has given us that um, 
are part of this place, this larger place we know of as Nineveh, and we can click right through them in Pleiades to see what they are. So in this particular case, uh, this is one of the gates in the northern wall of Nineveh, and uh, it has its own uh, location. Uh, it has its own um, toponymy, its own set of names, and uh, its own connections, one of which is the one that uh, gets us all the way to Nineveh. Uh, I believe this is one that is part of um, the outer wall, for example, uh, also itself a component of Nineveh. So um, we are, I don't want you to assume that you'll find this rich a level of connections uh, within all Pleiades data, but this is where we are starting to go with the data set, and it's one that makes it possible for us to begin to do things like um, express the um, location of a place, not just in terms of a point useful for putting on a map with a lot of other points as we did at the beginning, but uh, as a footprint, as a set of connected other places. Um, and that footprint could vary depending on the type of connection we're talking about. You know, we have this topographical notion that walls and gates and monuments are all part of the, the civic um, architectural infrastructure, but we might well be able to begin to talk about footprints that um, are related to to other kinds of, of concepts, nearness, connectedness, um, um, uh, shared language, lots of other things that we might begin to model either in Pleiades this way or in another project that takes uh, Pleiades data, combines it potentially with that from other gazetteers and so on. So that, um, that in a uh, too short amount of time uh, to explain fully is the footprint, if you will, of Pleiades, its basic structure. Um, you may have gathered that uh, we have the option of leaving out locations entirely. We have the option of leaving out names entirely. This lets us address, uh, in the first instance, places that are mentioned in an ancient source or an early modern traveler's um, uh, uh, document, but that we can't locate precisely today. We can uh, take those and use connections instead to say, well, we know from the ancient source that it was between place B and place C. So we can hook up those connections and get a general idea of the location. Or we might know from another ancient source that it was in a particular province. Um, Conversely, uh, we might have a place that's entirely unnamed, but that shows up in uh, modern archaeology. So we don't know what its ancient name was. It may not have a modern name today. It may only have some nomenclature that the archaeologists or a cultural management entity has assigned to it, you know, site Q733. Um, Pleiades can absorb that kind of information as well and begin to relate it also to this other sort of material. So I think I've gone on for about uh, 13 or 14 minutes here, which is bringing me close to the end of my allotted time. I do want to point out to you a couple of things uh, in Pleiades that will give you an idea of how things come to be. Our credits page, um, which is going to take a second to load because likely someone has changed something since the last time I loaded it earlier this morning. Um, this is a, uh, uh, you'll recognize something that looks like a masthead on a, on a journal or a uh, encyclopedic reference work. This is our editorial college and our reviewers. This is a group that grows. Uh, you may recognize a couple of names here. There are a couple of names. Oh, could you zoom in yep. a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, if you're looking for your own name, uh, Gabby, I haven't updated this yet since you uh, um, agreed to come on as a reviewer for us, but you'll be seeing yourself uh, next to Valeria here soon. And, um, down the page, then we list everybody who's made a contribution. Uh, it used to be the case by virtue of all the Dare locations we brought in, that if I sorted this uh, by contribution level, that Johan would be at the top of the pile. But alas, he's been surpassed by the um, prolific Jeffrey Becker, um, who's also on our editorial council. But uh, in fact, uh, any contribution, no matter how small, is quite important. And uh, we try to give credit where credit is due to everybody, um, including the person who only comes in and is able to make a couple of changes that um, nonetheless improve the value of our content.
I don't have time to show you how that process works, but we have a web mediated process for logging into Pleiades, uh, suggesting changes to content or creating new content that then goes through a review process and is published to the web uh, when it's reached the end of that review process. We also have, um, especially thanks to our last grant uh, that we got from NEH that have finished up a couple months ago, we have an approved mechanism for uh, ingesting data in bulk that's coming from other resources. So um, we'll be able, for example, um, I hope in the next year to have fully collated and bring on uh, Olaf Peterson's data that I was showing you earlier for the ancient Near East. That's something uh, he and I exchanged email about years ago, but we hadn't had the, the capacity in terms of uh, both staff and um, uh, tested software to be able to actually make that a reality. And we have a number of other collaborations uh, that we're working with to bring that on. And we're um, using that same set of software to begin to um, uh, do a better job of cross citation of the other gazetteers in our field, which include the um, digital gazetteer of the German Archaeological Institute, uh, viki.org, uh, the Trismegistos gazetteer, and um, Johannes Dare Gazetteer. And with that, I'd like to turn the discussion over uh, for him to lead. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Johann Olfeldt. I work at the Center for Digital Humanities in Gothenburg, which is quite a new assignment to me. I've been there since the 1st of March. Uh, and eventually, I will move the my digital atlas to Gothenburg uh, so I could continue to uh, maintain it for the future. Uh, we, and with all the infrastructural muscle that the university has, we have agreed uh, upon doing that. But I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the digital atlas of the Roman Empire, which I, is abbreviated as DARE or something like that. Depends on the mood. Um, and uh, I think I will start my uh, my slides, um, and then uh, in the end of the presentation, I will come back to the uh, to a live demo, uh, just like Tom did. Uh, yeah, let's see now. Like that. Yeah. And. I would like to start to, to say, uh, to explain a little bit what DARE actually is, because it's not a gazetteer from, from its out, um, outline. It started off as a geographical information system uh, of a historical uh, context, which is the Greek and Roman civilizations. But uh, during my work with this, I am, um, I focused a little bit on the Celtic uh, pre-Roman civilization of France and uh, middle, uh, the mid-European uh, continent, which was important to me, but I will come back to that in a bit. But of course, it is also a gazetteer uh, in, in, uh, in the way that uh, it lists all places uh, that are known to this uh, application within the Greek and Roman civilization sphere it it is because of this uh, as it started off with the geographical information it it, it is a gazetteer with a dual interface uh, you can access uh, the information both from the side of the map itself but you can of course also do uh, searches for ancient and modern names which appear in the backend database all data from the gazetteer is also machine readable and it could be exported. Uh, and it's, it's a matter of fact that you can actually set up a copy of the whole site uh, and well, anywhere in the world because everything is free. Uh, so the interface of the digital atlas looks like this. It's a background map to the left which I made from open um, sources, uh, you can say. It's uh, everything from a, uh, the, the, the topography is from 
the origin of, of that layer is from the uh, data from NASA, which have a digital elevation model of the entire planet. And then you can apply different uh, techniques to make uh, hill shading and uh, color reliefs of the um, topography. Uh, to the right, there is the um, input output uh, part of the application where you can use, whenever you click on, on a map, on, on a point uh, on the map, uh, information will appear to the to the right, but you can also do uh, searches for names, and you will. So this is what I meant with uh, this as a dual interface. And there are also additional maps in this interface, so that you 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 are you could be uh, you are able to study how a uh, ancient site looks uh, from the sky from with satellite photos. How how did it come? Uh, how come I started to develop the digital atlas of the Roman Empire? Well, I found that there was a lack of a digital historical information system of the Roman Empire on on the um, on the internet when I started this in two thousand twelve. I think, uh, uh, yeah, the whole thing was um, was finished by. 2015, uh, when there was uh, this first version of the map. And um, the reason why I did this be was because I, before I started uh, doing the Roman Empire, I had already developed a historical Gis application for the early medieval Frankish kingdom, which, you, which is still there after all these years. Uh, with the with the web uh, address that you can see on the slide. Uh, from my experience with the early medieval Frankish period, I when I saw the Barrington Atlas for the first time, I was a little bit disappointed because of the outer provinces, the uh, uh, the center for the Frankish uh, kingdom was a little bit underrepresented because of the large scale maps one to one million uh, doesn't have any uh, much room for for uh, details and details at the level that i wanted to study the, the transition from late roman uh, uh, from the late roman period up to the early medieval uh, period so that was my main motivation i think so and therefore i started to concentrate very much on western europe um, when I developed the Digital Atlas of the Roman Empire. As a historical GIS inform, um, system, um, I think I've created quite a unique background map of the Roman Empire. To my knowledge, there is no other attempts in doing so. Um, but the background map itself represents a uh, static view of the um, Roman Empire. And in order to overcome that, it is also possible to um, display additional both internal and external data sets on top of the, of the background map. So if we would like to focus on a specific type of place like uh, the Roman forts of the military, it is um, possible to do so. A, a little bit of techn technical data here. The, um, the maximum resolution of the map, uh, which comes in 11 zoom levels, is 1 to 250,000, which corresponds to a resolution of 76 meters per pixel. It's an, it's a normal a map that you uh, use to look at and to distinguish between different cities. Uh, the location accuracy of the um, of the places on the map is different, and it depends on what kind of source was used to get the location information. Uh, for those sites that could be spotted from the uh, from the satellite photos, there is a very high location accuracy. 
but for other sites where uh, the uh, source of information is the digitization of the printed Barrington Atlas, it is much lower. Another uh, feature, uh, well, uh, another characteristic of uh, this information system is that feature types are distinct for places. So one place can only have one feature type, and that uh, is developed into something that I call the main feature type of a place, which could, of course, be a little bit arbitrary, but you have to pick something which is important for the uh, period that the background ma map is depicting. So, for example, if there is something on a, in the place before the Romans even came there, like a temple or, uh, or something like that, it goes into the subplaces, which also Tom demonstrated that uh, uh, the Pleiades system it has also implemented since it left its heritage from the Barrington Atlas. And that means, of course, that we can go much more into detail than ever the uh, well than ever was possible for the Barrington Atlas, and we can go as deep as we as we actually need to distinguish between places that belongs to a bigger place. I mean, for example, Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire, has a lot of sub places uh, which we haven't yet. Uh, uh, implemented. I, I have always been trying to use the best sources available for creating this um, this um, uh, geographical information system, and there is a general lack, I think, lack of good information, uh, which is high quality because many scholars are still in this um, phase of denial that they don't share their data. So there are a lot of more data that could become available and for me to uh, do a much better job in, in creating a atlas of the Roman Empire. But the digital atlas is also a gazetteer and it owns a lot to the Barrington Atlas, of course, because that was a very comprehensive listing of 30,000 or even more uh, places with names, with feature types, with, uh, and thanks to the job that Tom and his team at the Play This project did uh, in collaboration with um, uh, uh, the Darm C project uh, at uh, Harvard University. They did a, a tremendous job in the initial uh, digitization of the location of the places. But the Dari uh, Gazetteer is also something else. It is an expansion of the Barrington Atlas uh, for the initial purposes that, that I mentioned, that I was interested in having a much more uh, detailed uh, map of, of what was going on in the western part of the Roman Empire to study the, transi the transition into the uh, Frankish uh, kingdoms later on. So I added a lot of places, um, and there are actually se more than 7,000 additional sites which is not uh, on the Barrington Atlas. Special focus for me has been uh, during this process of work has been to to align um, or the, my sources of information has been any kind of national cultural heritage sites listings that each nation of Europe provides. Uh, yeah. And there was also, as I mentioned earlier, a emphasis on the Celtic civilizations prior to the uh, Roman conquest of Gallia. But this means something uh, as well uh, as a downside of it all. I omit, I omitted a lot of sites uh, with especially water features, which are very hard to uh, 
to uh, accurately and uh, represent as points on a map. And I also omitted a lot of information about the groups of people that uh, Tom mentioned earlier. Uh, and that is because the uh, historical GIS system, which focus on the map, actually needs precise locations. And the map uh, works like this. Um, from the beginning, in an outzoomed um, view of the map, only the major uh, sites are visible. And then by zooming in the map, uh, more and more uh, feature types becomes visible on the map. And at zoom level 10, all, all places in my gazetteer are visible. We can skip this one, I think. I adopted a lot from, from the Barrington Atlas, for example, the way of, of uh, treating uh, place names uh, and also a bit of their, uh, uh, their concepts. Color schemes, I've, I've adjusted a little bit, so it uh, stands out on a digital screen. But the principles behind the, the place names on the map is the same as in Barrington Atlas. And I also used uh, uh, th this kind of, of um, ancient naming, uh, which re uh, reflect the kind of sources that are behind the map. Uh, there is one difference here, of course, and it's that I, I couldn't uh, have several names on the map because the placement, uh, the placement of the, of the place name labels were done automatically, and not as in the Barrington Atlas. I think they were adjusted by hand, so everything could fit in on the printed map. I put a lot of emphasis to the modern names um, because uh, it's a way of referencing what kind of locality we are actually talking about. So at the lowest level, there might be a site name, but it doesn't need to be. And a site name could be something that the archeologist archeolo will come up with. But there is, a specific and the nearest hamlet or village might be a locality that is referenced. And uh, more important, maybe it's the municipality where the, the, the site is located and then the modern province or whatever uh, uh, levels of administration we are dealing with and at last the country. So this is the kind of information that you could expect to find um, in the gazetteer. Yeah. And now we are approaching a little bit the uh, aim of, of why we create a gazetteer in the first place, because in GIS, we could have several separate data layers, which we could uh, uh, put on top of a map, but the different places in that, in the different layers are not aligned by other things than the coordinates. And if the coordinates are not exact, uh, it's very hard to tell that uh, two points actually represents the same place. And uh, to overcome this problem, um, by creating a gazetteer, we align data which could be uh, source material in various, like, well, both archaeological sources and written sources. And we assign uh, them to a gazetteer entry. Then by doing this, we can ensure the identity match across source materials and across gazetteers. Yeah, Johan, I'm just I'm just being a little bit conscious of the time. We're, we're okay, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. Mm -hmm. But then I um, I continue with um, the link to open data and semantic web technologies. Uh, 
by saying that uh, we have put a lot of effort in aligning our gazetteer to each other. And in the Pelagios project, uh, for example, where people with uh, source material could align uh, their data to one or more of the gazetteers in the collaboration. Uh, by doing so, um, their material becomes aligned with each other in the way I told before. Yeah. And these are a couple of slides. What you can actually do with um, when you have data that is published as data online, like the Princeton Encyclopedia of Classical Sites, because they give this out as data. And if you have the identifier, you can actually put this into your uh, system and uh, have resources like different types of coins and whatever could be in, in the uh, Pelagius collaboration. Uh, you can study the distribution of uh, material without losing the focus from the geographical uh, context. And this is a picture of, of how uh, satellite images can be embedded. And this represents the amphitheater and the theater of Syracuse in on Sicily. Yeah. So uh, that was it. OK, should we hand over to Valeria? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Gabby, and thank you both, Johan and, and Tom, uh, for this uh, overview of um, uh, two uh, historical gazetteers. So what I'm going to do now is uh, showing you two different examples of how we can use uh, the, the data from um, digital gazetteers and in particular they were um, identifiers. And one example is going to be the one that Johan was mentioning. Um, actually, both are from what Johan was mentioning, which is the Pelagius project, that is the, the project I, um, I work uh, with. And uh, one will be uh, an example of connecting existing data, and one will be an example of creating annotation and disambiguating them uh, through gazetteer um, identifiers. So. Um, I want to show you um, uh, the first of these two examples. Um, it's um, uh, I'm going to spend only two minutes about this, and um, it is um, a visualization uh, linked open data engine, a map-based one, and its purpose. It's called Periplayer, was developed by uh, the Blackest Project, and its purpose is actually to show what happens when a number of separate institutions, you can see uh, the list here, uh, contribute their data, data that have been produced uh, separately, independently. But the, the thing that these, uh, these data share are um, that they have both been expressed in the same standard format, that is uh, linked open data, and that they all use the same references when they talk about places. And what generates, I'm just going to give you a very quick example. Uh, this is, uh, as you mentioned, um, that about coins, for example. Uh, we have uh, a very rich um, database about coins. Uh, we have a, more than one, actually, database about coins as contributor uh, in this project. And you can see how data coming from four different archives uh, can all be located uh, on the map automatically. This is an API, uh, thanks to their, ref to their standard references to places through either Pleiades or the direct asset here. And um, you can filter by time and you know, play with it. Uh, uh, have a go. Uh, it's, it's online. It's free. It's called, uh, it's called Periplayer. You can search for places. You can search for uh, things you're interested in. But it's just to say, this is what happens when uh, we use gazetteer references for places we can start finding uh, connections among places and i just wanted also to show you uh, uh no I, I won't show you uh, but normally that shows uh johan's map <laughs> in player um 
the second part of what I want to show you today is um, another product another tool developed by Pelagius that is actually an annotation platform that is called Recogito, or uh, you can choose how you like to pronounce it. I go for Recogito, um, and I will show you how to use gazetteers to create semantic annotations. And because today it's Halloween, enjoy the Halloween um, homepage of Recogito that our developer uh, Reiner has created uh, for, for this week. Um, so you can create um, uh, an account and login. Uh, in the GitHub page you will find a quite uh, detailed um, tutorial for Recogito, so I'm not going to demo um, a lot about Recogito because uh, I don't want to go into uh, all the functionalities of Recogito also because we wouldn't have time for that, but I want to give you a little bit of a taste of how to use um, gazetteers basically. So um, in Recogito you can annotate um, text documents, image documents and um, uh, tables of data uh, in particular formats. You'll find all the information in the um, uh, in the tutorial. Uh, but let's open uh, a document that I have prepared. And let's change the order. So I'll find it. I'll find it more quickly. There it is. Okay, so I have uploaded this document. So I am now in my uh, own uh, workspace. I can create annotations in this text. And that means that I can uh, select um, um, a word or a portion of text. In this case, if it were an image, a portion of the image. And I can create an association um, between this part of my document and something that is outside my document, something that helps me to disambiguate the reference in the text and um, use a standard way to do so. So for example, let's go practical. I want to say that um, this, the word Genoa, the string of text Genoa, that I find in this text uh, that recounts the quite adventurous travels of uh, Piotr Fur, um, is actually the city in the north uh, west of Italy. So if I um, highlight the text, I will get this uh, pop-up to create my annotation. And if I say that this word talks about place, the annotation that I want to create is has to do with place, this is what happens. Um, I will have a disambiguation um, interface that will help me find the most suitable, the most adequate uh, gazetteer reference to precisely um, identify my place. So, for example, uh, Recogito at this point is suggesting me among its internal gazetteers, you will find a list of them again in the tutorial. We have covered, I think, seven or eight, and both Pleiades and the Dara uh, are part of it, um, as well as Geonames, which is the contemporary one that we mentioned at the beginning. Um, it's suggesting um, Genoa uh, in Geonames. Uh, now let's start with this uh, with this conceptual uh, problem right now, um, which is the fact that Genoa, as it is defined in geonames, is the modern city of Genoa, uh, which is maybe not the most adequate uh, match for what I want to talk about, which is this, uh, let's say, early Renaissance Genoa. And to be honest, Pleiades isn't either the most um, suitable reference, but it's up to me what I want to, um, what I think it's more convenient, what I think it's more appropriate. Um, I can choose the gazetteer that I want to use. I can also mix and match them. And um, the rationale of this, um, of this choice is really uh, very much related to um, to my research question. So in this case, I would choose 
um, the previous one uh, anyway. You see that I can recognize what is the gazetteer that we're talking about. It's definitely not Genoa in the United States uh, from its icon and uh, the green G is for geo names, the blue P is for Pleiades and the orange D is for Dare. And as Yuan was saying, the fact that Pleiades and Dare are, you know, uh, in the same basically suggestion means that they are aligned so that there is um, an information, a, a meta information that says that the um, identifier in Pleiades and the identifier in Dara are the same thing or almost the same thing. Um, let's just choose one and say OK. Now, uh, because uh, we are exploiting all the, you know, all that machine can do for us. So let's make the most of the automatic annotation as well. So one function that Recogito has is to reapply the same annotation to the other occurrences of the same word or you know, string of text. Uh, do we want to reapply this annotation? In this case, I would say yes. But um, bear in mind that is not always the best option. Okay, so you see that now we have um, a few words uh, highlighted um, in green. Another thing that we can do, uh, let's quickly find another, okay, another place here, Cyprus. And just again, place, yes, no, not in the Roman province, maybe. Uh, maybe in this case, let's choose the geonames one. We can also use comments and tags to enhance our, um, our annotation. And for example, I can't use the tag island. It's not a very smart tag, but that's the best I can think of right now. And there are also comments that we can use either to respond to each other's annotation because uh, more than one user can annotate the same document at the same time and can um, comment on existing annotation. Uh, so we can say OK. If we reapply the annotation, you will see we are reapplying the tag as well. But again, there is more information about the various options, including the advanced ones in the, um, in the tutorial. OK, now let's leave our friend um, Peo uh, just for the moment, because I want to show you something else um, that is um, this one. Okay, in this case, um, you see that in this text there are okay some words that have been highlighted um, in grey and they have been automatically produced by uh, Recogitus NER. Uh, which stands for Named Entity Recognition, and it's an algorithm that parses the text and tries to identify uh, place names and person names, in the case of place names, also to create an association with one of the available uh, gazetteers. It is another option that you have, especially for long text. Um, the green one that you see are those that have been actually uh, checked and verified by me, while the gray one, uh, like this one, uh, are automatic. And you see that there is a warning sign that says uh, automatic match. And in this case, for example, do we agree or do we want to change it? Well, in this case, as we are working with, to see this, uh, OK. Um, we definitely don't want Athens and Geonane, but we want uh, we want a more ancient uh, version of it. Okay. Now that you have seen the basics of uh, how to create um, a geographic annotation in Recogito. You can also create non-geographic annotations, but uh, for this class, we're very much focusing just on the uh, geographic ones. And um, actually, uh, there was another thing that I wanted to show you um, about. Okay, that was the file. Um, 
let's go into the map view. So one of the things that we can exploit the gazetteers for um, when gazetteer have location information, and it doesn't need to be, you know, a very precise coordinates location, uh, but, you know, also a generic location would be um, enough for us to use that, um, to use the annotations that we have created to disambiguate the references into text to generate a map and to generate a map that actually has a strict um, um, as a strong relationship with the text, because if we click on the map, we see where the annotation comes from. And we see also that, you know, the, the size of the dots on the map uh, is different, and that depends from the relevance of the place in the text. If, for rele if we take number as an indication of relevance, so the more, um, uh, the more often a place is mentioned, the bigger is uh, its dot on the map. However, I zoomed on this, I wanted to visualize this map because I wanted to show you um, something that is wrong and that again uh, I wanted to use to highlight the fact that it's really important when you create, especially when you create your visualizations, to choose the gazetteer that is uh, most adequate um, to the kind of analysis you're performing and the kind of text that you are analyzing. And if we Bear in mind that this is a representation of visualization of the places mentioned in Thucydides. We should be uh, struck by the fact that Italy, as you know, modern state uh, with this uh, border and uh, Sardinia and Sicilia uh, attack, uh, attached to it, it, was not a thing in the time of Thucydides. So. Uh, this visualization is possibly not the best one. But one thing that we can do is go back to our text and change the gazetteer that we have chosen, not geo names. Let's go back and let's choose something else for uh, Italy. Uh, if we can't uh, actually find the one that we're looking for, that's because play this X up with the English name of Italy. So, but this is another tip actually for when you're annotating, if you don't find um, the right gazetteer match in, uh, in the interface, one thing that you can try is to hack a little bit the search field. So try with another spelling of the name that might be more uh, familiar to the gazetteer. So let's try Italia. And here we have Italia as um, an ancient area uh, related to uh, the Mediterranean, so not uh, the modern state nation, but an idea of, you know, let's say the Italian peninsula. So let's select that now. Let's change uh, all the mentions of Italy and let's go back to our map. And we can see that that, you know, quite disturbing. Uh, borders of Italy has disappeared and we just have now a generic center point just to tell us okay there are two mentions of Italy um, in this in this text. Um, one of uh, the things that uh, I believe makes gazetteers so relevant when we create um, uh, semantic annotations is that uh, place is somehow uh, something that is uh, fixed and that we can use as a parameter to compare um, other things. So actually I've found that sometimes it is very useful to uh, analyze different texts together and see how they you know, relate to the same places and compare um, maybe the different views or compare the different coverage or whatever is your research question. And Recogito allows you to do that, again, powered by the gazetteer. And I just want to show you a couple of examples about that. Uh, okay, I have two minutes. Okay, this is, uh, if you upload, uh, and again, please read the, read the tutorial. If you upload more than one file in Recogito at the same time, what happens is that Recogito generates a sort of um, meta document that is made of each individual file that you can annotate singularly, but you can then visualize all together. And the thing that I've just showed you is 
um, the text of the inscriptions that have been found in Athens near the theatre of Dionysus um, as annotated by uh, a group of uh, Italian epigraphers. So I take that the annotations um, are correct, but uh, you can then, you know, maybe ask some questions about what were the places that were mentioned in those epigraphies and why, and, you know, how, how large was, you know, the, the coverage of those points, how, you know, something mentioned uh, Sicily ended up there um, and so on. Um, did I have any other examples? Yes, I wanted to show you um, something else that uh, is actually now related more to your exercise, um, which is um, about the use of tags when you create um, your uh, annotations. So for the exercise, you will see uh, in the GitHub page, what we are asking you is basically to choose a document or use one of the documents that, you, that we provide you with, um, either singularly or together comparatively, um, and create some annotations. And then try some of the different uh, visualization um, uh, modes in, um, in, Peripa, in Recogito. And one of them is to visualize things by tags. Um, and uh, for example, I want to show you very quickly a very simple, straightforward uh, use of uh, tags. And this is an annotation of an image, actually. And this is um, a beautiful map um, that is just on the wall uh, on my desk. And this is a, the visualization of the places. But if you go here in the map, you can um, change, you can choose uh, among this kind of visualization um, modes. And if you choose visualization by tag, you will see the, the places that I will see different tags. In this case, it was just certain and uncertain to, uh, they will appear um, with different colors. Um, very, 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 very last thing, uh, because I think I promised to show this, um, is, um, uh, is the issue of granularity of gazetteers. And um, a system, a tool like Recogito is only as good as the gazetteers uh, um, within it are good. And um, a big issue is sometimes that the place that you would like to annotate are not in the gazetteer, which can be a, a bit frustrating. And for example, I would be very much interested in um, uh, annotating places within cities, but that is hardly possible uh, with the um, with the available um, gazetteers. There are uh, some exceptions, and there are uh, so there is some uh, some work uh, in that direction. And one of the exceptions that I want to show you is actually um, from Pleiades. Uh, I will find that, uh, that book. Is it this one? No. So one of the few exceptions to this uh, is actually the city of Pompeii, uh, because thanks to the effort of some interested people, uh, among which definitely um, uh, Jeffrey Becker, that uh, Tom mentioned before, there it is. Uh, we have actually um, specific identifiers for some of the buildings in Pompeii, which allowed me to annotate, for example, part of this um, early touristic guide for Pompeii. And you see that when we start zooming in, uh, the, the map becomes a little bit unsatisfactory. But if we switch to area view, then this is actually um, much, much better. We see the annotations about the place it attached to the actual location of the single building. This is the Temple of Isis. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, the palestra. This is the Odeon and, and so on, so that we can see at a glance where we're uh, in the city of Pompeii, the places that this guide was, uh, was talking about. And, um, 
I should definitely stop now. Uh, you will find all the other informations for the exercise in the GitHub page, um, hopefully. Um, and yes. Great, thank you, Valeria, um, and and everyone. Um, so we are we're running a little bit um, later in. Um, in time than we than we had hoped. We'd, we'd have liked to, um, to have a little bit of time for discussion. If everyone's happy to stick around for five minutes, we can still do that. Um, I've now got put us back onto split screen, so um, we can see everybody we can all interact with each other. Um, there are still um, about half a dozen people watching this live, so maybe maybe we'll see questions appearing in the the live chat window. I encourage anyone who's watching, please do um, leave questions there if you want. But um, otherwise, does anyone um, want to to bring up any Questions or, or comments um, for for each other. I I would like to um, ask something on behalf of you know the students and the people that are watching uh, to Tom uh, specifically, and if it is okay if someone has a specific interest uh, to contact you guys at play this and saying. We would really like to work on this area, let's say, or you know, um, having we have a specific interest. Can we organize something about it? Can we organize a sprint, or even if you know they just created their their account, would that be okay? Yes, absolutely. Um, this is uh, this is the way we've worked with a lot of people. Um, the Pompeii uh, collaboration that you were describing. Um, we have. A, um, a group of people who work with the Ancient Graffiti Project who've been doing similar work on Herculaneum. There's a uh, joint French and Italian and Croatian project called the Adriatic Atlas Project that is uh, working to prepare their material for alignment with Pleiades, uh, the Syriac Gazetteer, um, I could go on and on and on. There's a number of, uh, and and then there's also individuals who have a particular interest in a particular area and they want to um, help uh, coordinate improvements um, in Pleiades. I was just uh, looking at something yesterday for review where somebody had said, look, you've got this site, but all you have is the Barrington Atlas coordinate, which as Johan points out, uh, is from a one to one million map. So you're you're talking about the size of the dot on the ground uh, is what, you know, 15 kilometers uh, in diameter, potentially, um, depending on where on the planet you are and what the scale is. And, um, and then, you know, how accurately it was placed based on the quality of the base materials that were originally used in the um, in the compilation. And so, um, you know, and he was able to say, you know, look, here it is, you know, right here, and here are my coordinates for it that I've I've drawn. So yeah, uh, we, we very much welcome everything from the large research project wanting to collaborate with us, um, uh, and essentially exchange citations effectively, um, but also to serve both those projects and individuals as a, um, a venue for publication of spatial data that otherwise would kind of get you know lost or swept swept uh under the rug on the way to a research paper or or something like that so yep very interested in having those folks Great. we have a question from youtube uh osama gad um has been specifically asking valeria um, does recogito work with um arabic text arabic script <laughs> Um, yes, so um, I think there are two levels uh, of answer here, and one is about the automatic annotation, so the, the NER, the, uh, the possibility to parse uh, the text uh, and identify automatically with, you know, not a perfect but an acceptable uh, degree of success, um, the place names. Um, that, at the moment, um, uh, we only have algorithms that are trained on five languages, uh, which are uh, English, French, German, Spanish, and Latin. Uh, so we don't have um, we don't have an algorithm that has been trained on Arabic yet. But uh, talking about the manual annotation, so you read the text, or you know you look at the images, the scan of the papyri, and you identify. Um, 
the place name. Uh, in that respect, Recogito is agnostic and it works with uh, all sorts of alphabets. It has been used with the Georgian alphabets, it has been used used with Russian. In that respect, it is agnostic. It is, um, the, the third thing is that it depends if the Arabic name uh, shows in the gazetteer or not, because you may, and I had this problem a lot when I was annotating uh, maps with uh, Arabic or Turkish names, that player this wouldn't recognize the, the, the transliteration of the place from Arabic. So I had to, uh, as I showed before, I had to actually, if I knew another name of the place that was more, uh, let's say, more recognizable for Pleiades, I would have to use that other name to find the reference. But uh, if you are willing to do, you know, this extra step, the system does work. So if you know that, uh, if you know the Arabic name and you know the Latin name or the English name, you can definitely create the annotation. You can definitely visualize that on the map. Or if by chance Pleiades were to ingest a few thousand Arabic names, that might, <laughs> you know. That's also a possibility. That yeah, it which the, which uh, people cards. which people here have been involved in preparing the data for, and uh, we're we're zeroing in on it. Yes, yeah. I, I note I note I note the jab. Yeah. Um, so Osama has another question. This this may have um, also may have several levels to it, maybe slightly more complex. Which is, could one use Recogito with um, the Markdown Corpus of Papyri? I presume he's talking about papyri.info. Um, um, well, that uh, I'm not sure because I don't know the corpus very well. I don't know in what um, what kind of uh, format we're talking it's about. It's TEI XML, okay. um, mostly Epidoc. Component. Okay, but the places are already marked, marked up no. or not? No. No. Okay. So Recogito actually does yeah. ingest TEI. No, it's standoff standoff markup. They will be okay. they will. They all be identified in the Truth Megastore database, but that doesn't that doesn't necessarily help us with this task. No, that definitely you can upload um, TI um, to Recogito and create the place annotations and then re-download as TI again. Something might be lost in the process, but the place well, and they're and they're heavily marked up, so yeah. Okay. Mm. Mm. Well, I guess. Um, it, it's a matter of what do you prioritize. Uh, you could create maybe a variant corpus of the papyri that is only geographic markup and make it, you know, somehow maybe interact with the one that is now heavily marked up grammatically and semantically and whatever, but doesn't have the place references. I think this might be a possibility. The other possibility, if, um, if as, as Osama says, the plan is to use this with students, one could imagine um, downloading just the text and just the, the HTML view of the text, so not the richly encoded um, XML markup, but just the HTML view of the text, because um, that's going to be easier to, um, to do any R on and to, to um, annotate that. And then the annotations that you create will have um, references in them, which will at least point you to the right text. Yeah. Um, and so you could you could do that annotation in Recogito, and when you download the data, you would have the visualizations of the geographic um, distribution of um, of the references in text and all that sort of thing would still be there. This this wouldn't be information which would then go into the info, but it wouldn't anyway because they couldn't take that sort of information. Um, That'd be very happy to experiment with this with you know with Tana. and it would be great to have uh, students from Egypt to work in this and another thing that I wanted to say is that Recogito is available in a number of languages not yet Arabic but quite a few um, that includes Turkish and Farsi for example um, German Dutch French Italian um. what would it take to get um, Recogito working in Arabic um, not, uh, I mean, you need someone that is generous with their time and translates the single words that are in the interface. Uh, but then we have, let's say, a standard spreadsheet with various columns, one for each language. And I think that it's relatively easy for Reiner to just ingest a new translation. 
when you say generous with time, you're talking about a couple of hours time or? Uh, the current or... version was mostly created in a one day workshop. Right. So we're talking about at least half a day. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This with a lot of chatting and you know and tea breaks and things like that but yeah this half a day that Osama and students in in a champs could also potentially yeah. get, get involved in doing yeah nice cool Does anyone else have any burning questions or comments you want to ask of each other or well, I wanted to mention to Johan that um, uh, this uh, the software that I'm I've been working on for doing um, uh, repeated uh, collation tests and so on. So it's um, I think the f the first batch of data I brought in with it was from Tobos Text uh, here a couple mm -hmm. of months ago. Uh, but um, I've been working on it to make use of the Dare API. Uh, for okay. for checking you know for basically checking things and mm -hmm. and looking um, uh, looking for stuff that we need to reference that we're not referencing and so on and uh, it seems to be working great so far so I appreciate you know not only the open uh, the open data but the API uh, mm -hmm. because it makes it you know makes it easier to do yeah so. and and I um, Brady Kiesling and the 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 guy behind Topos Text has yep. given me um, his file of uh, the topos text places at least so mm -hmm. i think i align you them. should um you should be able to find in our data um references to topos text for all of the places that um first he identified as being corresponding to pleiades mm -hmm. and that secondly our algorithm um accepted as unpro unproblematic Okay. So we did a yeah. we did both a um, toponymic nearness test mm -hmm. and, and a proximity spatial proximity test, and just lock, stock, and barrel put those in. There's others mm -hmm. that are on a list that he and I need to check um, to make sure that we don't have you know some mm -hmm. overlap or or a mm -hmm. doublet or something. But um, uh, but so you know if it helps you in any way, that stuff's in our data now for the ones that we're confident. You okay. know, that both he and I are confident yeah. are mm -hmm. right, um, and so you could. You could trust those, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, he has uh, access to topographic maps uh, uh, on a very detailed uh, scale uh, for the entire Greece that he bought yes. uh, in in the bookstore. So, and that's a, a resource that I never had. No, for, he's done. For Greece. Uh, yeah, he has he has assembled for himself uh, material that he. Mm -hmm bases his work on that's um that's really valuable and uh he does a ton of work he's a really sharp yeah. guy and he's yeah. he's very busy mm -hmm. um and uh he's you know he's done us all a tremendous service and he's mm -hmm. he's bringing in you know for some of the places in greece really interesting descriptive material from sources that um none of us mm -hmm. have no uh, you know, ha have connected to. This is independent of the ancient stuff, but modern descriptive yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah I know. Um, yeah. Of the sites that's really, um, yeah, I'm saying this mainly for the benefit of the audience, mm -hmm. um, that's really valuable. And so if you don't know Topos text and you're interested in the Greek world, the ancient Greek world, you definitely should check it out. It's a, it's an oh. incredibly valuable resource and mm -hmm. one that um, we owe both Brady and the foundation that's supporting him uh, on it uh, a lot of gratitude for. And you and will have seen uh, that um, uh, Anna and Elton uh, in Emir, uh, they created a local version of Recogito uh, with underlying uh, data from Topos text to annotate places within yeah. Athens. That is really, really mm -hmm. exciting. And I think you you, you worked on that, uh, you want to? Yes, I did, but uh, I've, I've, uh, I've left the project now because of my oh, okay. workload here in Gothenburg, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There were no other uh, possibility <laughs> than doing that. But I know, for example, that the National Archives of Sweden is also very interested in uh, implementing a version of Recogito on their yeah. service because they are working on a gazetteer of medieval settlement names oh, of yes. Sweden, which uh, they uh, uh, find very valuable for uh, the future and to align all kinds of historical re research with this gazetteer. Right. Okay. 
Okay, if there are no other immediate and burning questions, we might, um, we might let uh, Tom and Johan and Valeria um, take a break. <laughs> um, thank you all again very much for your contribution um, and Eleonora, of course. Um, <laughs> um, uh, thank you very much, and um, yes, and, and to the um, to to viewers, see you all next week, where we will be talking about linked open data with um, myself, Matteo Romanello, and uh, Paolo Granados. So, see you all. Thanks, next. everyone. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Bye. -bye.